Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time today to join us. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for OneOp. And once again, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session on caregiver identity conflict. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around today. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides that we're sharing. If you can't see them or have any other technical difficulties today, you can send us a tech support request via email to contact at oneop.org. We'll place that email address in the chat pod momentarily for your convenience. Note that the slides and resources are available for download on the event page. We'll also be covering continuing education information at the end of today's webinar, so please stay tuned until the very end if you're interested in those continuing education credits or a certificate of attendance. We also have closed captioning enabled today, so you can enable that at the bottom of your screen via the toolbar. As some of you have already done, we do look forward to having you join us in the chat pod today as well for conversation and questions and hellos. To embed the chat so you don't miss any links or conversations, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You should then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen and then you can select the chat bubble icon from there. When typing your comments and questions, we'd invite you to select the everyone response option from the drop down menu. You can adjust that right above where it says type message here. This just ensures that everyone who's on today's webinar can see those as they come through the chat. Thank you for joining us as we continue our partnership with the Department of Defense and the U.S. Department of Agriculture to expand the readiness, knowledge, and networks of the professionals supporting our military service members and their families. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn things over to our moderator today, Rachel Browner, and she'll also be introducing our presenter. Rachel. All right, thanks for introducing Coral and um, setting the stage for all of us today. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel Browner. I will be moderating today's session. Um, we are so excited to have Dr. Mary Brittnall Peterson joining us. She is not new to our one-op team. She's been doing a lot of work for several years in the caregiving gerontology realm. And so we're pleased to have her, especially as we close out the month of November and um, close out um, National Family Caregiver Month. So we're excited to be able to provide the content today and have Mary presenting on um, the caregiver conflict tips for providers working with family members. Um, again, if you haven't already done so, please feel free to type in the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from. If you have any questions or comments, um, I'll be monitoring it and we'll make sure to relay that information on to um, Dr. Brittnell Peterson. Just a little background about uh, Mary. Mary is a retired professor from the University of Wisconsin Extension. She now has a consulting firm, MBP Consulting LLC, where she does consulting work, um, gerontology, caregiver information, as she's doing for us today. Dr. Brittnell Peterson has focused on creating and delivering family caregiver educational programs for over 25 years. She's worked as a professional educator, but more recently, she was the primary caregiver for her adult son battling colon cancer. Her hands-on caregiver experience and professional expertise make her more sensitive and insightful to the needs of caregivers as she continues her passion of educating family caregivers. So without further ado, we're excited to have uh, Mary presenting. And so Mary, you want to go ahead and get started? Mary, you might be muted. All right, am I unmuted now? You are, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, that was a great way to get started, you guys. Um, I'm joining you from chilly Wisconsin as I saw somebody um, checked in that they were from Wisconsin too. So um, it's trying to snow here. And um, so we're, I'm laid up in the basement with a, and nice and cozy and warm so I could present with you today. It is indeed my pleasure to be with you today. Um, and I do want to share with you that the work that I'm sharing with you is some of the work that has been done by Dr. Rhonda Montgomery on the caregiver identity change theory. And I had the opportunity of working with her as she was developing that. And I really felt that it was um, key to understanding caregiver stress, and that's why um, I'm so passionate about it. 
but let's move on. Um, today, I'm really hoping that I'm going to um, help you understand and recognize um, when a caregiver is stressed and to utilize the caregiver identity concepts and theories to help reduce their stress. When I think about caregivers, um, I'm I can teach a caregiver how to change a wound. I can teach a caregiver how to give meds. I can teach them how to do a variety of things. But what's most difficult is helping them understand and deal with their feelings and frustrations and anger and um, all of the things that come with caregiving that seem as if they're the emotional aspects of it. And that's why I'm so passionate about this theory is because I think it helps us as caregivers to really understand why we're feeling the way that we do. And as um, Rachel mentioned my son, um, I cared for my son for two and a half years and um, as he struggled with colon cancer and I'm very fortunate to say he is still with us. So I was very fortunate in that, but that experience really um, helped me um, open my eyes um, and make my help the academic um, background that I have really come to life and understand it even better. So I'm gonna hopefully help you understand and explain to caregivers their identity relationships about stress. I'm gonna hopefully help you understand the rules um, that they have in their life that are helpful or not helpful and ways to decrease the stress. I'm gonna help you examine the three different kinds of caregiver stress that are that is, is out there and help you think about ways to decrease that caregiver burden. And I'm hoping that really ultimately that you will think about how to integrate um, caregiver identity into the discussion that you have with the caregivers when they're experiencing stress. And that's really my ultimate goal. Um, and I think a lot of you probably are already using this and it's intuitive. Um, are, and so hopefully I'm just gonna build on what you may already know. So to get us started, um, this is a polling question. And so a I would like you to tell me what kind of stress is most common about the caregivers that you see. Are they stressed because they can't get everything done? Are they stressed because of the tension between the care caregiver and the care receiver because of caregiving? Or are they worried, anxious, upset, frustrated because of caregiving? So if you could just um, pop in and vote which one it is. I know for some of you, you're not able to do that. So of course, just put your vote in the chat box and we'll be able to see that. But um, if you could just spend a couple of seconds now just voting, I'd appreciate that. Okay, we're beginning to see that um, as one would expect, you're seeing caregivers with um, a variety of different things that seems as if the one that is most prevalent right now is um, caregivers are worried, anxious, upset, frustrated, et cetera, because of caregiving. And um, we'll come back to that later on. So um, feel free to continue to vote if you want, but let's move on. And I put these as tips. Um, and if you happen to have your um, PowerPoint right there, you can write on it. And I want you to try to keep in mind a caregiver that you're working with in which you just haven't been able to figure out how you can help the person. Um, possibly it's yourself um, or it's a family member that you know. But as you all know, caregiving is not a short kind of stint. It is a journey. And the length of the journey will vary based on the care receiver's health condition, which is um, something that's a no-brainer. Um, if you're caring for somebody that has a short-term kind of illness versus somebody that has a, um, a, a long-term illness or a disability that will be with them for, forever. Um, the other thing is, is that no one care, caregiver journey is the same. And we recognize that all caregiver journeys are unique, but the reality is, is that there are lots of similarities among the various journeys that each of us take. Secondly, the caregiver journey is a process of change. This is probably not new to all of you, but what's important is to really focus in on what is changing. Um, caregivers are changing what they do because their caregiver responsibilities change over time. The relationship that they have with the care receiver, their role with that individual changes over time. And ultimately the individual that they are 
and their identity changes too. I'm a different person today than I was three years ago um, because of my caregiving experience and my identity with my son has changed because of that um, experience. So let's um, delve further into all of this. As I mentioned, all of our care giving journeys are unique, but they're unique for a variety of reasons. First off is because of the disability, the illness of the caregiver. The other thing we know is that very often, there isn't just one disability or, or illness that, that the individual is dealing with, is that there are multiple um, kinds of illnesses or disabilities. So it's very different caring for somebody with cancer versus caring for somebody with who has a leg amputated. Where the caregiver and the care receiver live. If you're living with a caregiver with the care receiver, it's very different than if you're a long distance caregiver versus if you're living in the same community or several miles away. Um, really changes the caregiver journey. The health of both of you. We know that the care receiver is unhealthy or needing some assistance, um, but we also need to think about what is the caregiver's health. Um, maybe the individual's pregnant and they can't do lifting. Um, they can't do some of the heavy kinds of things. Do they have other health conditions that makes it caregiving more difficult? Um, so we need to keep that in mind also. The next one is the finances of both. Um, is there resources available that they can use to bring in assistance um, or help pay for part of that assistance? And who has the resources? Is it the care receiver or the caregiver? And then of course, the types and amount of help that is available. Um, and that can vary. Um, family and friends are always one which we look upon, but sometimes that doesn't work out for us at all. Um, and the other type is that there are resources available in the community, depending upon when you where you live, you might have more resources available than others. Um, also, the kinds of assistance that you may need, if you're in a larger community, you may have more specialized kinds of assistance that is available than, other, than living, say, in rural Wisconsin or rural Wyoming. Um, so that's very important too, and makes it your caregiving journey unique. Next is, as I've mentioned, our relationships are extremely complex. And that's why making and understanding um, caregiver stress is so difficult is because it's with a relationship with another person. It's unique because of our identities. My identity with my son is that I was his mother. You may be a parent, you may be a partner, you may be a spouse. Um, there could be a brother or a sister. It could be um, just a variety of different relationships. Often we find that friends step in. Within those identities, we have roles. And those roles are things like, um, are you a friend? Are you a colleague? Um, what is the role that you have with that? Those roles have responsibilities and they all come with it. It may be that you're a joint decision maker. It may be that the responsibility that you have is financial management. It may be that your um, companionship. Um, um, so the, that the roles that you have do have responsibilities. And then of course, those responsibilities have tasks. If one of my roles is financial management, then I have the task of paying the bills, um, dealing with any kinds of insurance issues that may come along. And so it makes the relationship very complex. Moving along, this slide is really an illustration of what happened to me when my son became ill. Uh, my son is single adult living in Florida. I live in Wisconsin. Uh, we get a call that he has colon cancer. Um, it became very apparent once we got down there that um, he needed somebody to be with him um, and be his caregiver and be there for him. Um, so when I, before I got the call, my relationship with my son is I was in a mom. Um, once I got down there and realized some of the responsibilities I was gonna have to take on, part of my identity changed and I became a caregiver. And it's very important that caregivers understand and individuals understand that when they assume caregiving responsibilities, they take on the identity of a caregiver. Now it's interesting when I ask individuals, are you a caregiver? Are, are, 
or who's caring for your son or who's caring for your daughter or whatever, they'll say, well, I am. And I say, well, are you a caregiver? No, I'm not a caregiver. I'm his mom. I'm his whatever. Um, the reality is, is that we need to help caregivers understand our individuals understands that they are also a caregiver. And I'll illustrate the importance of that as we go forward. I'm going to use myself um, in sharing this. And what I want you to do is think about somebody who you're working with. And I want you, this is called an identity graph. And I'm going to want you to um, take a piece of paper out and try to draw the identity graph of the person who you're working with. Maybe it's yourself um, and that you're caring for somebody. But I have multiple relationship identities and I've identified three of them. I have a relationship identity with my husband, Bill. I have a relationship identity with my son, Will. And I have a friend, Terry, and we have an identity relationship. Now I can go on and I've got multiple, multiple, multiple relationship identities throughout my life. Um, and we don't think about that, um, that it's a relationship identity, but it is, and it's something that we um, act upon when we're with those individuals. Now, each of my relationship identities have roles. And what's important, and the reason that I'm going through this is that this is really key to helping you understand the stress that is happening within a caregiver. So bear with me. With my husband, I'm a best friend, and my role with him is also I'm a wife. For my son, I'm a mother, and I'm a cheerleader. And with Terry, I'm a best friend and a confidant. Now, you see there that I'm both a Beth's friend and for Terry and my husband, Bill. But the way that I carry that out may be very different um, because of our relationship and with my identity with each of them. So now, because of my role with each of those people, I now have responsibilities. You'll see that Terry's dropped off just to make the slide a little bit clearer. But I wanted to show you that, and this is before I took on my role as caregiver with Will. In fact, it's kind of now we're going back to um, the relationship that we had before caregiving. So I would still have these, um, these roles with him and the responsibilities. For my husband as his best friend, I'm a listener and I'm a travel companion. As his wife, I'm his lover and his partner. For Will, I'm, um, I provide, I'm a place of unconditional love and I'm a source of family traditions. I have a responsibility of sharing that with him. Um, I'm also his cheerleader, which means I'm a listener and a sounding board. Now, the reality is that I'm a listener again for both Bill and Will, but in different ways that I have that. So now let's take a look at um, what happens when I became a caregiver. Bill and Terry are still there, but you'll notice that none of the other graft items relate to um, Terry and Bill. They relate to Will. Literally, when I took on the caregiver role, my life changed, my identity changed, and I had to fit in this new um, role with Will. I now took on the responsibilities, the roles and the task of being a caregiver. So you'll see that as a caregiver, I became his advocate. I became his nurse and I became his financial manager. Those are responsibilities that I took on when I became his caregiver. I'm hoping that this is making sense to you because it really does help us understand later on um, why some of these create issues for us. Now, again, um, this only takes a look at Will, but I wanted you to understand that when you become a caregiver, we just do things. We don't think about that. Is it a role? Is it a responsibility? Is it a task? That doesn't really matter because as caregivers, we just do it. But when we're looking at stress, it does matter and it helps us really dig deep into figuring out why we're stressed. And let me tell you, as someone who was a caregiver in very dying times, we thought we were going to lose my son. Um, I really had issues between my academic knowledge and my um, caregiving hands-on daily 24-hour um, seven caregiving. And what I had to do was I had to identify what was my role, what was my responsibility, what was my task.
Okay, so now take a look at what happens to all of those various um, responsibilities I have. They each have a task. Um, let's just look at one of them under mother, um, under keeper of family traditions. I really had to create memories and share stories. That's part of my one of the tasks that I had with um, Will as his mother. Let's move to being a cheerleader. Um, as a listener, I had to let him talk and ask questions. And let me tell you, that was sometimes um, difficult. But now the caregiver one. This is where these are the new ones, the new task I, I took on when I took on his responsibilities of being a caregiver. Under being his advocate, I really had to research options and become a voice of support. There was a time in his care when he was in the hospital every four days. This was ridiculous. I had to research what were some options that I had um, as his caregiver, as his advocate, that we could keep him out of the hospital. As his nurse, I was responsible for dispensing his medications and taking care of his wound. He had a very ugly wound on the back of his um, back and that needed care. I had to learn how to do that. Um, he was unable to take his own medications because he was on heavy narcotics. Um, so that became a task that as his nurse, I took on. And of course, as his financial manager, we had all the issues with insurance and managing funds and paying bills and all of that. And he was in no condition to do that. But what's important here is I want you to think about before I was a caregiver for Will, I had the mother and cheerleader roles. Now I'm taking on an entirely different set of roles, responsibilities, and tasks. So keep that in mind. I'm hoping you were able to maybe create an identity graph for somebody that you know, because it really does help you understand what is it that they're doing, um, because all of that relates to our feelings and emotions. So let's take a look at those things now. It's very common as caregivers for us to experience lots of different feelings. And often when I'm working with caregivers, I tell them if you're not experiencing feelings, well, then maybe you know, you're not normal. I don't know any caregiver that hasn't experienced guilt, frustration, anger, depression, uncertainty, worry, happiness. And then of course there are joys and there are some positive moments and feelings in caregiving. When you get the, the report that it looks like the, the um, immune therapy is working, that is indeed a joy. Is your, um, I can't explain the feelings that you have when, when something like that happens. So I wanna make sure that we recognize that there are definitely feelings of joy and happiness in the caregiving experience. Unfortunately, we uh, focus on the negative ones because those are the ones that get us into trouble. So, and the other thing is it's not uncommon for us to feel all of these at one time. And sometimes it's even difficult for us to identify what is it that I am feeling, that's okay. Now, what's important with these feelings is um, when there's um, conflict between what you're doing and how you're feeling about what you're doing. And this is where we really get into the nitty gritty. So tip number seven really is important. It's not what they're doing, but what they are doing compared to what they think they should be doing that creates the stress. It's that should. Now, the other thing is, is that it could be the should could be related to what they're not doing too. So keep that in mind. So let's take a look at this discrepancy and the stress that it creates. The th there are three kinds of stress. And as you may have probably figured out, your question um, at the very beginning was related to these three kinds of stress. We caregivers experience workload stress, relationship stress, and emotional stress. So let's take a look at each of them. I went one slide too many. Workload stress. Workload stress is a stress where caregiving just is interfering with your life. They're unable to continue the responsibilities they had before caregiving. They probably can't, um, you know, do the kinds of things that they did before. They might not be able to be in the choir at church anymore. They might not be able to um, have their Friday night bingo night or, you know, pickleball um, get together. It really just caregiving is interfering with their life. 
Um, they're unable to continue responsibilities they had before caregiving. This could be even related to things like working. Um, is work interfering with um, caregiving? Are they going to be able to continue to work? Things like they have other children in the family. Are they able to do the things that they did before? Were they able to maybe re not read the um, nighttime story that they had read at bedtime? Are they not able to um, prepare the nutritious meals that they had been preparing before because of their responsibilities of caregiving? Basically, what this results in is that the caregiver has no time for self, commitments, or leisure, and they're really not able to meet their family obligations. So the whole, the reality is, is that with workload stress, caregiving is making their life and all the things that has that have to be done, making their life difficult. The next one is relationship stress. Now, what's important to realize about relationship stress is that it's the tension and the strain in the relationship due to caregiving. Granted, their past, rela their past relationship history may or may not make it easy, um, but this really is relating to the, the stress that happens because of caregivers. And often it happens because the care, um, the care receiver may be having demands that they feel aren't you know they're not legitimate i shouldn't be i shouldn't have to do that why do i have to why do i have to get up and get you everything when you're capable of getting it yourself um you know and they become resentful of having to do that um you often hear caregivers talking about well he's able to do that himself why is it that he expects me to do that so they're feeling as if they're being used um are doing something that isn't necessary um, or something that they really feel that they can, the care receiver can do themselves. So keep in mind, this is the stress and tension in the relationship due to caregiving. Um, this is sometimes, um, again, they're making unnecessary demands. They feel like they're being taken advantage of. The other thing with relationship stress is that they may be uncertain to how the care re receiver will act or behave. In some instances, um, they may, the care receiver may um, have outbursts or they may have some kind of something that they do that is embarrassing to the caregiver or the care yeah, to the caregiver. So they're really uncertain. So they may not do certain things because they're really not certain as to how the care, what, how the care receiver is going to react to that. They also may be embarrassed by some of the caregiver's actions. Um, possibly the person doesn't feel comfortable in crowds. And so they don't know how they're going to react if they get in a crowd. Are they going to have a meltdown? Are they going to shout? Are they going to scare some people? So they're very embarrassed because of that. And they're also uncertain. So you can see that it's because of the caregiver's um, situation that they're in that creates the relationship stress. The last one, which is the one that most of you um, identified as being the one that you see more most caregivers with and this is um, called emotional stress and this is when caregiving influences all aspects of their life but what's important here is that it's not related to any specific caregiver event or task so it's not related to doing x y and z it's just caregiving um it's when caregivers can't do anything about the situation. I know that I had a lot of emotional stress because there was nothing I could do about Will's cancer. It was growing. I couldn't stop it. No matter what I did, I couldn't stop it. So that created emotional stress for me. But I had to learn to deal with that. Also, it's when the caregiver is anxious or worries, even though they've done everything they could possibly have done. You've worked with them and you've worked with them and you've, they've implemented all the suggestions, but they're still anxious. They're still worried. They're still fretting. Um, and so they have to learn to deal with that emotional stress. Now, some of this could be related to other things that are happening in their lives. So I want to give you an example of one, and I'm going to have you identify the kinds of stress that you think it is. So here's here's the situation. Now remember, you can um, also respond in the chat if you want to. But Juan is caring for Christina, 
and has cared for her for several years. She has PTSD and can take care of herself basically with little assistance and is independent. At times, she becomes incapable of making decisions and needs some assistance. Um, but she's very uncomfortable being in the public, especially around crowds. She's been working with a counselor, but still isn't able to use public transportation. Juan feels very used and resents having to take Krista to all of her medical and counseling appointments, even though there's tra transportation available op options available to her. She doesn't feel comfortable using the, those services. Um, so Juan is stuck taking her to her medical appointments. But what rubs Juan the, the wrong way is that Christina seems to find ways to get together with her friends and go places and gets a ride and figures out how to do what she wants to do. But she won't do that with her medical appointments, which really sends Juan very upset. So what kind of stress is Juan experiencing? If you could just vote, I'd appreciate it. All right, let's see what you came up with. You guys are right on target. Relationship stress. You could see where, and I made the story pretty um, easy to, to find the answer. But And you could see that there was workload could have been possibly if he didn't want to actually drive and couldn't drive. But relationship stress was really the, the problem there. So that would be what we would want to work with Juan on is how to deal with that relationship stress with Christina. Okay. You guys are getting this. I'm happy to see that. Makes me feel good. Okay, but let's get let's dig a little bit deeper. What makes caregivers feel or think they should or shouldn't be doing a specific um, caregiver role, responsibility, or task? Now we're going to look at all those things that was in that that identity graph. We're going to look at the role. We're going to look at the responsibilities, and we're going to look at the task and what's behind those. What's behind those are our rules, our, our expectations. And that's really what's part of our stress formula. Basically, our rules, our expectations guide our actions. Um, they tell us what to do. Now, the reality is, is that we don't think about what our rules or expectations are. We just do it. We act, we act in, instinctively. Um, you know, when something happens as caregivers, we respond. We do what needs to be done. And then maybe afterwards, we begin to think about, ooh, why did I, why did I do that? I don't feel comfortable with what I just did. Um, and as caregivers, we just do what needs to be done. Um, and we do it without thinking. Now, the other thing is that after caregivers do, they may become uncomfortable or question if what they did was right or not right. So let's take a look at where our rules come from. Our rules come from basically three places. Now, the reality is, is that I'm talking about this into relationship to and stress re in relationship to caregiving, but it deals with all aspects of our lives. Um, all of our rules um, guide all of our relationships, um, but I'm really focusing on caregiving. Um, but I want you, you to realize that it's also can happen with other with other relationships that you have. So our rules come from our global society. They come from communities and they come from families. And we spend a lifetime um, developing our rules um, and expectations. So let's take a look at each one of them. And I'm going to be very simplistic in what they are. Um, one of our global rules and expectations is that a, a good mother makes sure her children are safe. We make sure they have a house, food, and clothing, and that they're loved. And that's just something that we just kind of expect. All of us expect, you know, what a good mother should be. Another good, another global uh, rule is that we don't go out naked. We have clothes on. Now, in some cultures, um, certain parts of the body are not covered. Are they able? To, are they? It is very. Uh, it is not against the global society to be naked. So we have to keep that in mind too. But think about the global things that society and how they are um, helping to form and create the various rules that we have in our lives. Now, 
The next one is communities. How are we um, communities that we live in? Now, the thing is, is that we live in lots of different communities. We live, live in a geographic community. And a good example that I often use here is that um, my grandchildren are being raised in Kentucky. And um, my daughter married a gentleman in Kentucky, and they are teaching their children to say, sir, ma'am, um, Miss Mary. They're very formal. In Wisconsin, we don't do that. Um, so it's, that is a rule within that geographic community of being in the South, being in Kentucky or whatever. Um, the other one is that um, in some places, um, they're, they're not as formal. So we need to keep that in mind. Within our faith communities, and this is a big one for caregivers, I think, um, there are different expectations and different rules. I think about um, in a Baptist church or in a um, some churches, when the spirit hits you, you are able, you yell out, you feel the spirit, you share the spirit with the community. That might not be as acceptable in a Catholic um, church where things are much more formal. In the Muslim religion, they um, pray toward Mecca and in other faiths, we don't pray toward any, we don't pray toward Mecca. We can pray anywhere. With some religions, they believe they can only pray at certain places. Um, and so that just gives you an idea about some of the rules that come with our faith community. In ethnic communities, um, there are a variety of different rules. Um, in Wisconsin here, um, we have a lot of different ethnic communities. We have Danish and we have German and we have Swedish and we have Polish and all kinds of communities. And each of those various communities have their own traditions. They have their own um, ways things are being done, um, which is fine. But those all add to who we are as a person and the various rules that we have um, within it. Also, being in a, an African-American family, um, the rule is, is that the family is extended. It's beyond just your immediate family. You include your brothers and sisters, uncles, un uncles and aunts um, with it. And then of course, there's other communities. And one of the communities that all of you deal with is the military community. And I probably won't shock you, but the military does have a couple of rules that come into play um, for caregivers and for the care receivers that have to be dealt with. Um, and these would be ones that I wouldn't find um, if I'm working with somebody who's not in the military. The rule that is expected to support the soldier, the whole idea that whoever is left um, in the home, that person keeps the home and takes care of the home while the soldier is away uh, at in active duty. Um, the whole idea that um, you take care of people in your unit. I often hear um, caregivers talking about uh, sometimes a soldier will want to spend more time with their unit than they will at home because they feel more comfortable with their unit. That's where you know they have strong relationships. They feel as if those people understand them better. But um, that was quite interesting to me when I spent time on the various bases um, as we were working on this information and on identity change theory and stuff. So again, those communities, your um, fraternal organizations um, are also groups in which have rules. Now, probably if you're like me, you haven't sat down and really thought about a lot of this, but um, it's important that when we're dealing with stress, this is one of the ways that we can begin to get a handle on where our stress is coming from. Now, this last one is one that I know all of you haven't experienced at all, but our family rules. I often hear when I'm talking to caregivers as well, we don't talk about money. You know, if I'm caring for mom or dad, I don't even know what kind of money they have because we don't talk about money. We don't talk about the will. Um, it's just a forbidden subject. But if you're providing care, you need to know what kind of money is available. Another one is what happens in our family stays in our family. The whole idea that they really aren't receptive to outsiders coming in. Um, it's a rule. We can take care of ourselves. I've actually heard caregivers say, no, I'm not getting anybody from outside to help me. My daughters will do it. My family will take care of me. We don't need anybody else. The reality is, is that those daughters and those family members were 
stressed to the hilt and couldn't do everything that needed to be done. Another very common one in families is caregivers are always women. And the women get the personal care. And if um, brothers and brothers and uncles and others are going to help out, they do the lawn mowing. They do the financial stuff. Now, I don't want to say that that isn't helpful, but um, women are the ones who get the personal care and the household kinds of things that have to be done. Um, so those tell you a little bit about um, you know, the family rules that we have and how and where our rules come from. Now, the reality is, is that with these rules, we have some options associated with them. Um, we have the option that we can accept the rule. You know, I've looked into my rules and the family rule of that we take care of our own for right now, that rule seems to be working quite well. And I'm just going to keep that rule. I don't think we need outside help. Um, I can tweak or adjust my rules. This is one that um, I use quite a bit um, with caring for Will in that I'm not good with money. Um, but my daughter, she happened to have worked for an insurance company. You know, I didn't need to, I knew as this caregiver, I needed to make sure that the financial management and the insurance stuff was taken care of. But I tweaked, tweaked my rule that I didn't have to do it. Somebody else could do it. It got done. And it got done much better than I could have ever done it. And our daughter took care of all of the financial stuff because she understood it. So I tweaked my rule and I didn't feel guilty about giving it up. Now that may seem very um, simple, but it gives you an idea about that. The next one is I can reject or throw, throw out the rule. The whole idea that this rule is really not very helpful to me. This rule is causing me a lot of stress. Maybe this rule is old. You know, we don't need it. Um, one of them that is another simplistic example, but it's the use of technology. You know, grandma or grandpa may not want to have technology in their house. Um, and their rule may be that we're going to be simple and we're not going to use those modern things. But they may need to throw out that rule and accept technology. The other thing is, is that we need to create new rules. Sometimes the rules that we had just aren't working. So we need to create new ones. And the reality is, is that many of us create new rules so that we can continue to function. Does this make sense to all of you? Uh, Rachel, do we have any questions at this point? No questions. There's just been a few comments. Okay. Um, and one of the comments was just going back to your slides on um, global rules, community norms, and how um, those influence the care recipient's comfort level with accepting care. Right. Um, good point. The reality is, is that with accepting care, um, the care receiver has to change some of their rules too. Now, the and the way that that can be done is that we can help think about different options um, when that comes into mind. And sometimes it's easier when we um, can explore their options with them um, and also understanding the relationship and what's important for the care receiver um, and what's important for the caregiver. And it's hard to really, you know, give you a specific example of how that works, but you can work with rules and, and, and the acceptance of outside help. Because one of the ways that I've seen it done is, okay, mom, it's not safe for you to continue to be in your home. So we have some options here. You can, I know that you feel uncomfortable with bringing inside somebody from the outside in, but you have the option. You have the option of we bring somebody in to help you with your care or else we're gonna have to move you to a care facility because a care facility then is yes, as an outsider, but we can't continue to do it, mom. So sometimes by giving them options and helping them understand um, how it is, what, what the rule is, helping them understand that rule. Well, why is it that you feel like you, we can't have outside and help? You know, is there something that you're concerned about? Are you concerned that somebody might steal from you? Are you concerned that they might mistreat you? Um, and once you know what the reasoning is behind the rule, possibly you can address that and say, 
often one of the ones I hear is people being robbed when somebody from the outside comes in. Okay, well, we can help deal with that. We can make sure that we're dealing with a bonded agency. We can put security cameras in. We can, you know, make sure that anything that's of great value is not in the house. Um, so I hope that helps a little bit, but you can really work with bringing in outside help once you understand the rule that's enabling it not to happen. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Let's go on and um, take a look at the phases of caregiving. Now this is, I've alluded to this before, but there are really phases of caregiving. Right now, before you start caregiving, you have a relationship and that relationship doesn't have anything to do with caregiving at all. But like myself, when I um, took over for my son, all of a sudden, part of my relationship and my and I started becoming a caregiver was when I took on and decided that I was going to move to Florida and care for my son. I became a caregiver and needed to recognize that my relationship with my son has changed. And I was in the very beginning of caregiving. As we go through the caregiving um, phases, there are certain trigger points that kind of happen as we move through these phases. In the second phase, and the one where it's half and half, and this and the spouse could be a parent, it could be a child, it could be whatever the relationship is. Usually as the addition of more and more personal care is needed is when um, these things happen. Um, and that we move from one phase of caregiving to the next phase of caregiving. And with each phase of caregiving, you as an individual recognize that your relationship is changing. I now have roles and responsibilities as a spouse. I now have roles and responsibilities as a caregiver. And sometimes those roles and responsibilities can be in conflict. Another simplistic one of this, I'll give you an example with caring for Will. Will lost lots of weight and I having my background, um, I have a nutrition background and you're supposed to eat healthy meals. You're not supposed to have sugar. You're not supposed to um, have milkshakes. You're not supposed to have candy. You're not supposed to have ice cream. Well, we went and visited with the dietitian, and the dietitian said, you let him eat anything and everything he wants. I was to the point where I was making him shakes three times a day. As a mother, that was, you just wouldn't do that. You don't do that as a mother because that's not good to nutrition good nutrition. But as his caregiver and my responsibility and role as his nurse, and I needed to get him to gain weight. That's what he had. He had to have weight. He couldn't, I mean, it was important for chemo. It was important that he have the weight and not lose anymore. So um, just an example of how your roles can come in conflict with each other. And what was helpful for me is knowing this so that when I had conflict, I could say, now, Mary, are you is your conflict because of how you think you should act as a mother? Or is your conflict about how you think you should act as a caregiver? And sometimes it was easy for me to figure that out. And other times it was very, very difficult um, to figure out. So then you would move to half and half. Now, really when what happens is when they become predominantly a caregiver, that is where their life is consumed with caregiving. And they are very, very little of a spouse. And all of their decisions are based on being a caregiver and very little is based on being a spouse or a partner or whatever your role was. Mine was mom. Now, the last one is um, where they're really a, become a full-time caregiver. And what can happen there too is that they're, they're just totally consumed with caregiving. Now, at the time of placement, they can then regain their original role. So if you are to place an individual in a care facility, then you can like be in that one where you're, um, you would return to being a spouse and caregiver like the second circle. So you're just really doing, you're still his caregiver, but you're making sure that the physical and the demanding care is done by somebody else. And you can, uh, and you can regain your spouse, your original relationship. And this is really important and something that when individuals place in care facilities, 
we encourage them to think about what what did you like to do before you were a caregiver? Did you like to dance? Did you like to play puzzles? Did, did you put puzzles together? What were things that you did before and try to regain that space? that original role. Now, these phases of caregiving are important because what's going to happen is that as we move through caregiving, we have the option of moving from one um, phase to another phase or staying in that phase. And what happens is that when you're feeling the conflict, um, we call it identity discrepancy. And it's a term used to determine when the caregiver actions and responsibilities do not match their rules. So caregiver actions don't match their expectations and rules and the caregiver responsibilities don't match their rules. So this is where there's tension between the two. And a way of showing this is if you have a rubber band, take it and squeeze it and put it between your two hands and pull it out. On one side is your actions and your behaviors and on the other side is your thoughts and feelings about what you do. If you pull that, that's an example of the stress that you're experiencing. So you have to change one of those. You have to either move in your hand with your actions and behaviors or you have to move in your actions about what you do. So I like to, and this is a good visual to use with your caregivers to show them what's happening when they're having identity discrepancy. I love this slide because it just kind of illustrates how, you, how, how we feel when we have identity discrepancy. And again, it's not what you're doing, but what you're doing relative to what you're doing and think you should be doing. When that happens, you have two options. You can make a small change, or you, which keeps you in the caregiver phase that you're in, or else you can move to the next phase. So this is an example of a small change. You stay in your current phase of caregiving. The way that you do that is you change your rule, you tweak your rule, or you change your behavior or your self-appraisal. So this tells you how you can stay within that. You don't want to take on any more of the caregiving responsibilities or roles. So the way you do that is by um, tweaking your rules, changing your behaviors, are thinking differently about what you're doing. Now, if you're going to make the big change, this is where you literally take on the new phase of caregiving. And you've actually moved from one phase to the other. And there are some ways that you can do that. The ways that we reduce the stress when we're feeling these things and in the big change is that we can change our personal rules, our standards, we can change our actions, and we can change our self-appraisal. And there are supports that we can provide to caregivers so that that can happen. So our rules to achieve balance, and this is to achieve balance means to have less stress. Again, we can accept the rules, we can tweak the rules, we can reject or create the rules. And the supports that help them do that, and this is what's important, is because this is what you as care managers can provide for them. That can be done through counseling, it can be done through small groups, through media blogs and networks. You see that all the time where caregivers are supporting of each other. No, you shouldn't do that anymore. Or yes, you're doing it right. You know, you shouldn't feel that way. Don't listen to those messages. Um, Educational classes or other kinds of supports are ways to achieve balance when the rule is out of balance. Now, when your actions is what they're doing, there are some things that you can do. You can actually stop doing it, have someone else do it, have the care receiver do it, or find ways to make it easier. And all of that can be done through assistive technologies, in-home care assistance, family and friends, and respite. So the whole idea is that you stop doing the action itself, and these are ways. So I'm hoping you're seeing that the way that you can achieve the balance when it comes to actions are the various resources that are identified there. And the last one is in order to achieve self-appraisal, to achieve balance. And this is the one where um, with worry and some of those things, this one really comes into play is because they're, they're, um, they need to change their self-appraisal. They need to stop listening to those voices in their heads that telling them that they're not doing the right things. They need to get rid of those negative um, messages. The other thing is, is that sometimes we get negative messages from people around us you know, from other family members. They're very good at giving us negative messages. We need to um, 
you know, get rid of those, not let, have those in our lives. The other thing is that we need to find ways of getting positive messages. So we can do that through support groups, through counseling. Um, again, blogs are great ways where that um, comes, um, can come in and be very, very helpful. So, so I'm hoping that that gives you a little bit of, of understanding of that. We have run through things very quickly because I only had an hour. And if you're like me, you probably have questions, but I kind of want to summarize a little bit about this um, in that caregiver stress, is, we're really getting down to the what of the caregiver stress. We know that the journey is unique and we know that there's the three types of stress. You have the relationship stress, workload stress, and emotional stress. Helping you identify what the stress is helps you identify ways that you can help them understand the why. Is the why related to identity discrepancy? Is it because they're doing something they don't think they should be doing? Again, we get down to rules. Okay, where did your rules come from? Were they a global rule? Are they a family rule? Are they a community rule? Are they a global rule? Is that rule helpful? Not helpful? Should we get rid of it? Should we create a new one? And then lastly, the way that you do that is that you match the stress to the resource and then you encourage them to use the resource. Now, what I find really helpful and what I try to do with caregivers is I try to say there's lots of resources out there. If one doesn't work, let's find you another one um, because we don't want them to think that if it didn't work, um, you know, that, that they're doomed. It can never be changed. It can be changed. They just need to use a different kind of resource. Now, um, I'm thinking it's that I've gone through a lot today and I'm very um, comfortable. If you have questions, you can um, send me an email and I'll try to get back to you. Often that might require conversations, but um, this is really, it, I've hopefully made it look very easy, but as you begin to work with it, it's not easy um, because you have to really help the caregiver and help you think about ways in which you can get the caregiver to identify what the rule is, help them identify um, why it is that they're not wanting to accept that support, why it is they feel the way that they do. Um, so I see that, um, uh, Rachel, are there some questions there? Yeah, we have a question from Deb. Deb asked, how do you work with family members who cause caregivers a great deal of stress? Everyone has their own idea, belief, yeah. and idea of helping. They all contribute verbally, but do not volunteer to help in person. This right. is very stressful for the caregiver because they begin to question their decisions. You're talking about family dynamics, right? Um, not easy. What's important is that the caregiver needs to determine what it is that they need for themselves they need to determine um, and they need to determine how they're going to take care of themselves the other thing is is that what i have found is that they all have ideas sometimes bringing in an outside person and having a family meeting because the outside person can say some things that an inside person um, can't say um, and can really identify that in order to take care of this individual, the whole family has to work together. Um, it's not easy, um, but it can be done. And the other thing is, is that they all have their own beliefs and stuff, but we look for the rules. We look for the common, the common parameters that they all have. One of them is they probably want the person they want the person cared for. Okay, if we all have parameters that we want mom or Joe or whoever to be cared for, that's what we're going to work to achieve. But then we have to come to agreement as to how it's done. The reality is, is that some of them will um, back out. Some of them will be naysayers. You, you try not to listen to those. The other thing is, is look at the talents and the skills of each of the family members. What is it that they can do that would be helpful to this overall goal that all of you have about taking care of the individual? That's a real quick answer, Deb. I hope it helps a little bit. Um, but the other thing that's important is that as you work with a care, caregiver, um, help the caregiver understand why is it that they are questioning their decision? Is it because maybe they've had this role in the family of being the one 
um, you know, what's the role been in the family always? And they may be going against the role that the family sees her in or him in. And so that has to change. I'm no longer that role. I'm no longer that person. The way you think and, and think about me is different now. That's all changing. Thanks, so, Mary. Great. I'm going to go ahead and post in the chat again a link to today's um, event materials. So if you are interested in resources, additional resources on caregiving, um, a copy of today's PowerPoint slides, and CE information, continuing education information, I've posted that link in the chat again. Um, give us a few minutes to get the button up and available. You might have to refresh the event page here shortly. But today's webinar, we are providing one CE credit for social workers, licensed professional counselors, licensed marriage and family therapists, case managers, patient advocates, and those that are interested in receiving a certificate of attendance, a general certificate, we are also providing that as well. You will need to complete a survey and then follow the survey um, directions and instructions to receive that CE credit. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email us at oneopmilitarycaregiving at gmail.com. Thank you, Coral, for posting that email address in the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to um, reach out to us and let us know. We'll provide you some additional information if needed or provide you with some assistance on getting that CE certificate. That CE certificate is automatically generated and sent to your email, so you may want to check your junk box or your junk email um, before reaching out if you are unable to find that um, certificate, that email certificate. As we close out, just a reminder, um, December is right around the corner. In fact, it's tomorrow, which is crazy to say that out loud, um, but December is upon us. And as we think about closing out 2022, um, we are going to have our last military caregiving webinar on December 7th. So stay tuned, get connected with us. The last webinar of the year is going to be focusing on resilience for you, the provider, working with families. And so please join us. Um, we're going to be talking about challenges that you face, how to become a resilient um, service provider as you work with military families. Um, that information is posted on the PowerPoint slides, but I'll also post that link here in the chat as well for December 7th. So get connected, RSVP and um, register for our last webinar of 2022. If you have any questions or comments, we'll stay on for about one or two minutes. Um, for all of our information, whether it's caregiving, nutrition, wellness, family development, personal finance, um, net lit, network literacy, um, join us at oneop.org for all of our resources and information. A big thank you to Mary, Dr. Brittnall Peterson for today's webinar and the content, a great way to close out National Family Caregiver Month in the month of November. So thank you for the content and your time today and your expertise, we really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to all attendees that have joined us. At this time, we'll go ahead and start to um, give one or two more minutes on, but we'll close out the session and, and we'll stay silent as you gather any last minute resources in that chat. All right, we're not seeing any additional conversation in the chat pod, so we're going to go ahead and close out. Again, if you need to get a hold of Rachel and her team, you can simply send an email and they'll be happy to assist. Thanks again, Dr. Brentnell Peterson, for your expertise today, and we will see y'all in December. Take care and have a great day.